Doing? Yeah. How many folks do we have there? Can somebody do a quick head count? Twenty. Is that what I heard? Sixteen, I'd say. Sixteen. Yeah. Great. Great. Tig, good to see you, front row and center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thanks so much for um, having me in your class for a little while here. I really appreciate the, the time and the energy. Um, as uh, Teague and probably Sam can tell you, I was uh, down in Rex with uh, those folks for uh, the regenerative uh, agrarian training or the agrarians training. And during that presentation, I had the opportunity to present on this work. And um, also during Permaculture Voices 3, I had the chance to do some presentation on this work. And um, Eric and Ryan were both interested in me presenting to you folks and potentially passing on a little bit about what I've learned in the time. And that's how we found ourselves here. So uh, as the little name bar says, my name is Javin Kirby Bernakovich. I'm from British Columbia in Canada. I'm in the interior in a place called the Boundary Region in a beautiful, um, beautiful valley called the Kettle River Valley. And today what I want to do is I want to pass on what I've learned when it comes to life design and how it applies specifically to regenerative agriculture, the permaculture space, um, what you folks are learning and doing. If I had the opportunity uh, to go back in time seven years ago when I got into permaculture as a land designer, edible landscapes, doing large-scale farm design, working with 3,000 acres or five acres, I would have learned uh, these modules first. And that's really how this all came to be, is I wanted to take a look at what was necessary or what was useful and pass that on to students. So what happened was about four years ago, I was working with permaculture design certificate students. And I don't know if this has been the case for you folks, but after a permaculture design course or any sort of educational uh, course, you got high octane content, you're super excited, but more often than not, you have no steering wheel, you have no map, your general fuzzy vision about what's going on, you're really excited, you wanna tell everybody about what's going on, but you tend not to have the tools about implementation. Now, what I love about the Eli program is that uh, it's, it's tailored to really give you folks a jumping point to really understand where to go and what to do. So this is really complimentary to what you folks are already learning and what this is all about. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch back and forth between some slides to give you some context and some conversations uh, as we go forward. Um, so we're going to start off, uh, this is All Points Life Design. It's about creating a ruthless clarity of vision prepared for you folks and uh, all about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how to do it well and how to do the right things, not just get stuff done but get the right stuff done. So my design aspect of my company is called All Points Land Design. That's allpointsdesign.ca. Um, I've worked internationally in Cuba and Kenya. Uh, doing key line work, um, also um, working remotely in places like Mongolia and India. And um, what I found in this work is that most of us feel like we have to be this lone wolf and we have to do this work by ourselves for ourselves. But as Russell Scott said, we have to do it by ourselves, but we don't have to do it alone. We can work with each other and we can learn from each other. Similarly, P.A. Yeomans, the creator of key line design had a wonderful saying that we have to plan the work then work the plan so if we're going to go out and design a landscape we're going to do an assessment we're going to take inventory we're going to understand what the needs of the client are what the ability is of the land we're going to understand the marketability if we're working on intelligence for income as i tend to do now as i work in larger scale and all of that is creating a plan and then as we implement we work the plan if anyone's ever heard the other saying no plan survives versus implementation. When I do design, all of my plans are working plans. And as I started to work in life design, that too is very, very true. The other thing I want to say is that this work is, is difficult work. Um, it's as difficult as digging a 10 cubic meter pond by hand, three degrees north of the equator, uh, in the hot, hot sun, when you have white Nordic blood and everybody else is looking at you like you're crazy because you're not wearing a shirt. If anybody wants to know why this is so crazy, um, take a look at my calf color. It's the same color as the soil. So this is work that's, that's hard work, but 
it's the hard work that's the work that's necessary. And as a um, uh, client in their late 50s was telling me the other day, this is the hardest work he's ever done, but it's been the most useful work he's ever done. So my process has been built into three different units. First is holistic life context based upon Alan Savory's holistic management and holistic context. It's really about getting to the why of what we do and understanding why we're doing it so we understand our motivations and we put ourselves into the right place at the right time. The second is called Zones of Brilliance, which is about understanding who we are at a DNA level. So all of us came into this world with a specific ability, with a specific gift, and Zones of Brilliance was aimed specifically at helping people understand that. The third is Business Canvas, which I'll touch upon, but I won't have um, the time to go into it in detail. This is a $15,000 business design tool that if I could train all of, trade all my business education, I would have traded for just this one sheet of eight and a half by 11 uh, piece of paper. Now for those of you that are thinking there's, there'll be a lot to write during this uh, presentation, you'll have to put a lot uh, down on your notes, don't worry about it. Uh, if you're interested in a PDF of this presentation, I'm happy to pass it on. The only thing I ask is that you fill out a little survey, let me know how the presentation was, what you took away from it, what you enjoyed about it, and uh, I'll send you the PDF, no problem. And I'll send that to, to Damien uh, basically immediately after our presentation here. So we're gonna run through these three aspects so you can understand them in, in, in greater depth. When we're taking a look at these three aspects, uh, we wanna understand that the first one is really about creating a map and compass. I don't know about you, but my life has largely been designed for me. Folks have told me what I should be doing, where I, I, I should be putting my, my efforts, and the dream has been basically the same for, I think, everybody. Go to school, go to university, get a good job, make sure it's secure, whatever that means in 2016. Um, have a family, get a mortgage, put on the golden handcuffs, look forward to retirement. Now, the problem with that is that somebody else's map for you. It's, it's a map for you, not for them. And as soon as somebody is designing your life, it's designed to make them money and to make them profit, not you. And so if you haven't actively designed your life, that means you're running on somebody else's program. Somebody else is actively programming your life and you're allowing them to dictate the terms of how you live. Uh, if you walk out of Eli without considering how you wanna be a designer or a landscaper and how you wanna operate your business, you will have taken belief systems from Eli, good or bad, uh, that's actually up for negotiation, but somebody else will have been designing how you want to apply your landscaping business. I'm gonna give you some case studies of clients I've been working with in the landscaping sphere, and they have niched themselves in such a way that their clientele is abundant and they come to them looking for work. Now that's because we were able to take a look at the specifics of their life and their life context, and we, were, we created a design for themselves. So the main thing I want you to take away here is that if you haven't designed your life, somebody else has designed it, and it's for their benefit and their profit, and not yours. Which means if you haven't taken a look at the belief systems that are uh, running your life, good time to start. So that's really the map and compass aspect here. That's creating a good map and then making good decisions. Um, how many people out there feel like they make incredibly good decisions quickly and elegantly? Show of hands, anybody? Tumbleweed, tumbleweed, tumbleweed. <laughs> a couple people tentatively, right? Most of us haven't been steeped in how to make decisions and that's really where holistic context and holistic management from Alan Savory's process makes a, a lot of sense. He just never tailored it to people. When we get to the roots, it's really about finding how or what we're really good at and how our story applies to our work. And third, understanding the boats or the boots. How are we actually going to get to this place? What's the business going to look like in this, in this situation? The what, the how, and the, uh, the what, or the why, the how, and the what. So holistic life context. How many people there have had an experience of working with holistic context or holistic management? Couple, yeah. Has anybody done it professionally or, or used it to good results? Not yet. Okay, sounds like a few. Um, when I was working with holistic context, when I was taught it by a friend of mine um, 
who we were Skyping back and forth. We were having beer Skype dates. I don't know if anybody else does this. Brilliant way to keep in touch with folks and, and colleagues. But he was teaching me about holistic context, and he kept on showing it to me, and it was I found it very confusing. And I kind of pulled it apart, put it back together, and I thought, okay, well, this is just a coloring book. All we're going to be doing here is taking a look at this coloring book and filling out these different areas. And so what are these different areas in holistic context? Well, the first one is called the whole under management. And if this is new to you, the whole is the project you're working on. If it's your life, that's the whole you're working on. If it's your business, that's the whole you're working on. If it's a project, like a big project, that's the project you're working on. The whole under management is the inventory. It's the present tense of what's in front of you. So first off, we need to know the decision makers, you need to know who has veto power within this whole or in this project. This is really important. Alan pointed this out when he was working with um, grazers down in Texas. He didn't include all the individuals that were necessary to have the project be successful because there was a few folks that were not involved in the decision making process. And because of that, the project failed because they didn't understand all the decision makers. So first off, we need to know who's operating this whole. The second thing we need to figure out is who and what and where are all the resources or the capitals that are being played with in this whole? What, what's an inventory? If we're gonna make a brilliant dinner, we're going to want to take a look at all of the different inventory of what we have. Now originally, it was resources and finances from holistic management, but Gregory, um, uh, Landua and Ethan Rowland came out with the eight forms of capital. So we have a higher resolution tool. Now the eight forms of capital takes a look at living capital, everything that's alive, spiritual capital, our intent or what or why we're doing it, cultural capital, the stories, our myths, our taboos, takes a look at social capital, the people we know. If this was a song, it would be the who are the people in your neighborhood from Sesame Street. It's all of the capital of the people we know. Material capital, the things we can tangibly touch intellectual capital, the things we know, the recipes we can pass on, the things we could teach, experiential capital, the things we have muscle memory in, and then financial capital. Now, more often than not, when we think about capital, we're thinking just financially, but when we start to break this apart into these eight forms of capital, we start to have a holistic sense of what's all of the material wealth we have to work with. Um, this has been such an important process for me, not only in life design, but land design, every single client I work with goes through holistic context. I won't work with somebody unless they go through it because it allows me to get detailed data on them, especially folks that are looking for me to design farms or income and understand if their skills, their attributes, and their strengths actually lend themselves to the Haskap farm they want or the hops farm or the mixed farm or they're trying to do hydrosols. They're trying to, to go into a speciality market. This is one of the highest resolution scans I can do of a person, just like we can have high resolution scans of a property and get down to an amazing uh, contour interval. We can do the same thing with people if we just use high resolution tools. So this is what's called the whole under management. It includes the decision makers and includes the eight forms of capital to inventory the project, to understand what's in front of us. Um, I'm gonna hold questions until the end unless people are, are burning with questions, in which case, wave your hand and uh, we'll stop, but I've got a short amount of time and I got a lot of stuff I want to pass on to you folks. So that's the whole under management. Um, as we go forward, we get into the holistic context. Now, if the whole under management was the present, the holistic context is the future. If you've ever heard the conversation that context is king, this is because if you understand the context of what you're doing or why you're doing it, you're going to be able to make really good decisions about what needs to happen to get there. So in my work, I don't know about anybody else if you're designing already or, or Damien, but I get calls and people say, Javin, I heard what you've done. I've seen your website. It's great. I want the farm. As if I'm some sort of vending machine. They press the button, out comes the farm. Now, implicit in wanting the farm is a number of quality of life um, purposes. They want to be close to nature. They want access to nutrient-dense food. They want to have a sense of community, they want to have a sense with the outdoors. Now, if anybody out there has ever been a farmer, I was for a very short amount of time, those things tend to get eroded when we do not place quality of life above a goal. When we have a goal and we strive towards that goal, that goal means that we're gonna to get to a physical 
substance, a tangible moment. I will make $25,000 this year. I will land an $80,000 job. But if we're not careful, we're going to lose the quality of life that makes our lives so rich and so enjoyable. Uh, I can't tell you the number of clients this year that have come to me with exactly this problem. And they placed a goal above their quality of life. And what happens is your quality of life suffers and you make it to the goal. But the only reason we sleep well at night is because our quality of life is great. So, so what if we get the farm and we can't sleep, we're not well fed, we don't have that sense of community, our family is leaving in droves because it was a horrible experience to get the farm, mostly because what we wanted was having nutrient-dense food. Well, how many ways are there to get nutrient-dense food between uh, dumpster diving if we want to go super cheap to growing it, which is a bit more expensive and labor-intensive, to CSAs, to direct uh, farmer buying clubs? There's so many ways. So hopefully the big takeaway here is that when you're designing your life, when you're designing your business, what are the quality of life statements you want to have true be about your business, be about the whole you're managing? So here we're taking a look at the statement of purpose, the reason why you've come together. Typically this is used for folks with um, two uh, entities or more that have come together, but I find it's really useful for working with even um, – single individuals, then we go into quality of life statement. So let's take one for example, like um, access to nutrient dense food. So I have access to nutrient dense food would be a quality of life statement for my life, which it is. Well, there's behaviors and systems and forms of productions that we need to make sure that this becomes true. That would be uh, access to that type of food. It would be time to invest in sourcing that food or creating that food. It would be education or knowledge, it would be materials. These are all the things we have to do without being specific and without having decisions or actions. Now, if all that comes to pass, if everything actually happens to create a, the future we want, what's gonna be the result? That's the future resource base. This is the feedback loop. Well, I'm probably going to have uh, improved health. I'm probably gonna look forward to meals. I'm probably gonna say, mm, a lot more. This is a way of really creating feedback within the loop of what we're doing. And that creates the holistic context, which is the future. Testing questions are used to take any decision or action that will affect the whole or that we are going to take because of the whole and see if it actually fits, if it makes good sense, if it takes us towards the right direction of our holistic context, if it's going to actually create these future resource bases. If it gets to the root cause of the problem, has anybody ever worked with a client or, or yourself and worked on a problem where you ended up trying to solve a symptom instead of solving a problem. You tried to put um, a Band-Aid over the leak in the dam instead of working on the dam itself. We have to take a look at all these testing questions to make really good decisions. And when you're practiced in it, it can take no more than five minutes to make eighty dollars or $150,000 decision. We did it last year. I worked in a collaboration, a designer's collective, we came up to an incredible opportunity financially to do a design for a 10,000 square foot house, the landscape for it. Um, normally you can take a look at 10% of the build price is usually what the landscape will cost. And uh, it was going to be financially lucrative, but they wanted two putting greens. They wanted a hundred foot um, uh, gas line out on their dock. There was all these things that were not congruous with the rest of our quality of life statement. So we went through this, uh, it failed multiple times, we went ahead with it anyways, and sure enough, three months later, we were so bogged down by this decision, we reassessed and we said, you know what, this isn't doing any of us any, any favors, even though it was financially lucrative. We dropped it and it was like taking off 100 pounds. We were able to move forward very quickly and very elegantly. Um, every business I work in now, and I've got four business enterprises I'm working with, Every single one has a holistic context. It is the most important tool I found in permaculture. And if I could, I would have learned about holistic context and testing questions first. And then I would have put content into it second. Because we're so interested in the goal. And you folks and me, we're more susceptible to you know, scroll through social media or go onto a site and be completely overwhelmed by this amazing new thing, whatever it is, be it turning plastic into oil, through a machine process or a new type of uh, phytobacteria for what it's, it's able to do in the garden or the recent uh, humus discussion that's going on. And we become enthralled by it because most of us don't have a really good rudder, really good map that allows us to understand what to do, 
where to go, and what's next. So when we take a look at holistic context, it's really about getting the why down, understanding the why, and working with these testing questions. And I think one of the things I like best about the testing questions is that the end here is gut feeling. I had a chance to speak with Alan Savory uh, two years ago at Permaculture Voices 2. I, I showed him my work, and I feel like I got the stamp because he goes, well, that sounds very logical. Made me laugh a bit. Here's a man who's been doing this for his entire life, and he says, I think you should continue because you're applying this in such a specific way. So this is the way I work with holistic context, and it's the first unit I work. If folks are interested in learning more, um, great article to start with is on permaculturenews.org. If you search their holistic management and veg, very edible gardens, amazing company to take a look at down in Australia. It's a great place to see, a great place to look. Um, so testing questions, what we're doing is, here's us, right? Everything just needs more stick men to really make it understood. And here's our testing questions, and here's our decision, or our action, or our income stream. And what we do is we test this against us to make sure it makes sense. And I can tell you more often than not, the decisions that are coming to us, our, our ego comes into play, uh, what people will think of us, our status comes into play, and we make decisions that actually don't fit our quality of life, and they decrease our total quality of life. So this is my context to give you a sense of it. This is active as of May 2015. Quality of life statement for me, one of them. I'm light, focused, confident, stress-free, and excellent physical and mental health. This is the quality of life statement. Forms of production are I stretch, I eat nutrient-dense food, I engage in physical activity, I do not overcommit, I leave unscheduled time, I breathe clean air and uh, clean, uh, bring clean air and drink clean water. I have access to good health care. So notice I'm not saying I'm using a specific type of filter uh, for water, for example, or um, where I get my dense food. It's just saying that that's something I need to create the quality of life I want. Now, when we go over to the forms of production, some things for me that are important is to have reciprocal relationships in my life, to have financial surplus, to be a craftsperson. Uh, and for me, just because this is one of my weak links, doesn't take me a month to get back to computer messages, right? Totally something specific to me, but something important as a feedback loop, as an indicator to understand where I'm going. We cannot manage what we do not measure, and most of us haven't built in metrics to see if we're on the right track, doing the right thing in our lives. And that's the beauty of having a holistic context and using it in a smart way is that the future resource base shows us if we're getting closer to what we actually want. This is about creating a ruthless clarity of vision. It's kind of like being pregnant. You can't be kind of in your ruthless clarity of vision. You can only be in your ruthless clarity of vision or not. So if a decision allows you to move forward with your life, then great, it's within. And if it's not, it's without. And this is an important piece that was passed on to me by the current mayor of Victoria. She passed this on during her campaigning is to have a ruthless clarity of vision to work with. It's a knife, if you will, to cut through the distractions, and everything else in life. One, uh, one of the last things I'll say about holistic context is if you've ever used um, any sort of sharp um, implement or tool, most of these implements and tools, they wear down over time, right? So they're wearing down, they're actually not um, improving, they're not regenerative as a tool. They're not anti-fragile as a tool. Holistic context is one of those rare, rare tools that gets better with use. Because as you bring up a decision to say, is this the right decision for me, for my whole, whatever it is I'm managing, and it's a yes or a no, it actually influences if your holistic context is correct. It tells us, actually, I didn't think about this other aspect that's really important to me, or these aspects that I wrote down were actually not important to me at all. So it refines itself. It's self-sharpening, if, if such a thing actually exists, as a tool. And it's why, for me, it's the most important tool in my toolbox because it keeps me focused in action and it keeps me ruthless within this clarity of vision. Um, as we go on and take a look at some of the other um, units, I want you to keep in mind that everything is based upon one and another. So there's dependencies, just like in the agrarian scale of permanence or the, the uh, scale of permanence by, by yeomans. All of this is about dependency. So unless you have this finished first, Everything else is going to be slightly wrong, just like if you work the fencing before you work the earthworks, as I've seen happen many times, 
chances are the fences get covered in earthworks. So uh, web designer I was working with as a client of mine said this, which was, I thought, just brilliant after he went through the work. Instead of choosing a goal and letting my lifestyle be fluid around it, I embrace my ideal lifestyle, and my goals become fluid to support it. This is a game changer. So Jeff called me about a week after he came to an evening presentation I did, and he said, I don't know how you did it, mate, but I have more disposable income. I'm eating better. I'm sleeping better. I have a better relationship with my partner. Everything's better because you just said focus and get to the priorities, but don't let the priorities be goals. Let them be quality of life statements. So as we go forward to Zones of Brilliance, now we're kind of getting into understanding who you are, your leverage points. <coughs> For folks that understand um, key line design, this is like understanding your key points where life naturally wants to aggregate. And so there's three aspects here. What are the perennial passions? Now, first off, I need to say that I'm not a huge fan of uh, Joseph Campbell, who said, follow your bliss, you know, follow your passion. I think he was actually wrong, and that's a bit controversial to say, but I think he set up a generation of people to constantly follow bliss into hedonism and into overconsumption and into all these other aspects when there's so many other pieces to passion. There's inclination for sure, but sometimes inclinations lead in this circuitous route all the way to something you would have never imagined, as long as you're aware that you're constantly moving towards something fascinating that's within your story as a person. It's the progress that's actually success, not arriving. It's the movement that moves you through there. The other aspect there is your gifts. So what's in your DNA? What were you naturally born with that you're just exceptionally good at? Now, some of that is meticulous work. Some of that is uh, an affinity for plants and them having affinity for you. Not everybody has that. But really understanding what your gifts are and not trying to be or do the things that you're not good at. You can learn about them, but outsourcing or collaborating or human gilding with others to do that work. When I started in permaculture and land design, I was not a good renderer. So I sourced it out to a student of mine that was in a, a class once, great graphic illustrator. I'd draw my uh, chicken scratch, I'd send it to them. I helped them build their skill sets in their portfolio. And I landed 150, 200,000 jobs because of it, because I had the ability to show something that was at a professional level that I couldn't do in terms of a rendering aspect, but I could do the other aspect. And if, if I don't say this at the end, I'll say it now, your highest value offering to your clientele is your thinking. It's your diagnosis of problems. When we go to the doctor, it is our diagnosis of problems that we're going to. Treatment can happen anywhere, and in the States, I've, I've learned this more so than any place else, uh, you can get the treatment in Mexico, you can get it at a multitude of different tiers in terms of health uh, providing, but you want your diagnosis to be of the highest caliber possible. And that's what you folks are. You guys are investing in diagnosis, in understanding problems, and in solving liabilities for clientele, and then allowing that to support the work that you're doing. So that's a gift that we all have in this sphere. The bottom is perceived problems. Now, this is really important. The problems that we want to solve in this world, they're the canvas on which we can paint because I'd much rather have a problem that I wake up loving to try to solve every single day than a passion that's a bit more ephemeral, let's say, or hard to pin down. The Rosetta Stone was solved by a non-scientist that went at it for 20 years. Einstein worked at his work for 25 years before he came to a real conclusion. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, when we took a, take a look at Madame Curie, all of these folks were working on problems and those problems allowed their passions and their gifts to be brought out to this beautiful place called the sweet spot. These are niches that are native to you and only you that you can really excel at. And I want to show you some examples of how that works. Once we build up these ideas of gifts and skills and problems, because we're going to populate these areas, and these are just like the zones we looked at in permaculture where Things that are closer to zone one are things we do with a lot more ease, and things that are further out are things that we don't. So we ask ourselves three important questions. So let's say, for example, teaching for me is, is, is a gift. So do I enjoy this? Absolutely. Do I have skill in this? People say I do. Am I more for this? This is a really important question. Regenerative. After I get off the phone with you folks, am I, am I just fired up and stoked and really enjoying this? Or am I walking away being like, well, it was okay. I kind of enjoyed it. How many times do we do that in life? How many times do we do that even in our businesses where 
be it landscaping or doing the design work, there's something about it that actually just doesn't fire us up. So these are the three questions I ask about all the different elements within passions. I ask those three questions. Sorry about that. We're kind of going backwards and forwards. Um, all these different passions, I ask those three questions. Gifts, I ask these questions. And problems, I ask these three questions, being do I enjoy this? Do I have skill in this? And am I more for this, or is this regenerative? Maria Popova of Brain Pickings has this beautiful quote. The long game, the key to, for, to being interesting is being interested in your work. Doing this for other people, pretzeling for other people, you become embittered, and it starts to show in your work. Does anybody know somebody like that who's just not doing the work they love and it's show, starting to show? It happens even in our industry. There's people who are doing it for too long. But I want to show you some case studies here. So this person had a uh, passion for permaculture and food. They had a gift of organization and motivation. And the problem was there was no good local food access. You're all designers. You tell me what this person did. What was their native niche? Take and Sam, you can't say. <laughs> What do you figure? What do you think they did with, with this with this motivation? Okay. Okay. Well, what they did is they put together a food hub. This was one of my um, students out of a PDC that I um, helped to guest teach. I give all my students at the end of a PDC a 10 by 10 by 100 challenge. Within 10 days of the course, in 10 hours using $100, make something of it. And because I work with business, I tell people to make a business. Within two months, these folks had a food aggregation business that is now the, the, sole, um, the sole income for these two ladies. All they do is source amazing food and make sure it get, comes to people. They didn't have to be a composter. They didn't have to be a designer. They just worked where they were really passionate about. These folks, um, passion for remeeting soil, gifts for writing and interviewing and storytelling, no remediation resource about remediation. What did this individual do? Lila Darwish, she went on to write Earth Repair. She interviewed all the incredible earth repair folks and remediation folks that were out there. And she basically showed the process. And in it, she wrote a book. She became an authority in it. She was able to build her craft. Another passion, another student of mine, student spaces and permaculture. They had a gift for urban planning. They actually worked for the city before they came out to a permaculture course we did in Cuba. And there was no permaculturist working on a city level. So what did they do? This is Lindsay Meads uh, in Calgary, and this is Adrian Buckley. Lindsay was fresh out of a PDC. She took the skills that she already had. She partnered with Adrian, who's an amazing plant um, aficionado and geek, and they created Regenerate Design. They're working pretty much so solely now with institutions, both the private um, schools, the public schools, and the Catholic school board in Calgary. They're doing food forests. They're doing naturalized playgrounds. These are the folks I was talking about. The, the city is saying, listen, here's an RFP. We want you to bid. We know you have the skills because you took the skills you had and you put them into practice. Case study, woman in agriculture, passion, writing, interviewing, and storytelling, gift, problem, no source for women in permaculture. What did she do? Trina Moyles, she's writing the book, Woman Who Dig. Every single chapter is a different chapter of a different country where she's lived and interviewed the woman and talking about how women's stories are never um, supported, mostly because the work is suppo uh, supposedly um, not important, yet it's the f they're the first agriculturalists. Um, case study, I already talked about this. This is a student of mine, took some beautiful chicken scratch, turned it into a beautiful graphic design, which I could present to um, a client to get the job. Folks probably know who this is. They had a passion for epic shit, mm -hmm. always talking about epic shit. Gift for interviewing, <laughs> curiosity, and exploring. Yeah. Lack of permaculture examples. Who's this? Diego. 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 Right? Now, here's a fascinating piece. Diego's a good friend. And uh, here's Diego. And he still hasn't found what he wants to do in permaculture. We're, we're doing a monthly podcast right now that's due to be out at the end of the month, all about life design and permaculture. And here's a guy who still says, I'm not really sure what I'm doing, but I'm liking, I'm, I'm enjoying the exploring, right? So his pathway in permaculture has included uh, close to a million downloads of people trying to understand it. Another long-term client of mine, hand tools of passion, gifts for forging problem, lack of locally handmade tools. What did he do? Hmm. Reforged ironwork, started to make um, handheld tools locally crafted from 
leaf springs from re resalved steel, working with local farmers, testing them out, breaking them, making them better. Uh, another case study, permaculture education was a passion. Gifts, a lot of experience, permaculture landscaping. Problem, no education for permaculture landscaping. Anybody put these clues together? Right? Just finding the needs and solving the problems of individuals and providing it in an exceptional way. So we don't do permaculture, we use permaculture in what we do. So the question is, what do you do? Who are you at a fundamental level? And that's what Zones of Brilliance goes, to at, goes at. It tries to figure out who you are and tries to understand where are these native niches, where are these sweet spots for you? So it's this process of I love what I do because I'm good at what I do, because I love what I do, because I'm good at what I do, because I love what I do, because I'm, folks are getting this. We're trying to connect the dots before we jump into something that we don't understand. <clears throat> so I wanted to share this with folks. I think income is all about creating a watershed. It's a watershed of income. Sometimes things trickle. Sometimes things are incredibly gushing. They're, they're geysers. They're main tributaries. So the whole under management, the zones of brilliance, the holistic context, this is the core of who you are. Now, the testing questions provide a membrane to see if these income streams are a good idea, if landscaping is a good idea. So currently, I have this many income streams. These are all the different income streams I have. If we're going to be um, non-monocultured individuals, we have to diversify. So I design, I install, I consult, I speak, I coach, I mentor, I teach PDCs, I do short courses. I do life design, I used to naturally build, do affiliate sales, tree crops, plant sales, and nursery are on hold right now as I've moved. I teach internationally, I Skype teach as I'm doing with you folks. I had a microgreens business for a little while. Um, it was highly profitable, it took us eight weeks to put it together. Um, we were profitable from our first sale. We increased our profitability. It wasn't for me, I sold the business. I learned something, I understood it, and I moved on. I'm not holding to anything because I'm looking for my product and I'm looking for the ability to deliver something that people love. So I just want to pass this to people that the market for something to believe in is infinite. So just like Eric's idea of don't have a marketing plan, have a community investment plan, people believe in what you're doing, they'll talk about what you do. So I want to give you a big take home and the take home is what's in a name. So I'm a big fan of calling your business what you do. Um, all points land design, what do I do? I design all points of land. All points life design, what do I do? Design all points of life. This is a client I was working with for a while. 2013, they called themselves Food Forest, Food Forest Worldwide. And you'd imagine that what they were doing is they were doing Food Forest Worldwide, but that wasn't the case. 2014, integrated living landscapes. Lots of jargon, kind of confusing, okay? 2015, living landscapes. Well, what does that mean? What are you actually doing? So finally, they took my advice, 2015 to the present, uh, Nick, on the left there, and Josh, uh, put together edible landscapes design. Is anybody confused about what these guys do? Anybody? <laughs> right? You know exactly what these guys are doing. They're edible landscape design. Please, for me, don't call yourself like <laughs> an oasis of permaculture. Like, just tell people what you're doing. It's so difficult anyways. The confused mind says no. Everybody who comes to your business is a yes, a maybe, or a no. The no's are leaving. The maybes are leaving. So you got to tell people exactly what you do, how you do it, why you do it. Show them your point of view. Get them excited. And then let them make their own choice. I love on my website. Take a look at it. I have a good fit page. And I tell everybody, take a look at the good fit page before you work with me. Because it's all of these things saying, I don't work with everybody. I like to work with people who are like this. And I'll tell you, out of all the jobs I've sold in the last six months since I put this thing together, I've sold every single job. Because people who are calling me come through the website, they pre-select, and all the people that come through are already the clients I want to have. So however you can, make sure that people understand who you are before you start to sell whatever it is you're doing. Really make sure that that's clear. Um, as we go forward here, and you've got to go back before you go forward apparently, um, we're going to talk quickly, and these guys are great. Uh, when you take a look at um, visual language, and really showcasing your work, they've done an exceptional job. So really check them out if you're looking for uh, good examples on, on uh, business basing. If I had two choices, make a business plan or make a niche statement, I would make a niche statement every single time. Why? Because you take a look at the most important things that your clients need to understand what you do and how you do it. So niche statement is, 
we, I work with these kinds of people struggling with these kinds of problems, feel this way about their problems, helping them to get these results. The people, the problem, how they feel about it, and what's the result. Why would this be important? Because if you can't pitch what you're doing, it's going to be confusing to everybody. So I'll give you a couple examples here. Kathy Whitham, this is out of the permaculture realm. I help parents who are at the end of the rope successfully stop the power struggles, connecting with their kids and restore peace at home. Anybody confused about what Kathy does? Right? Simple to the point. Um, the case study, this is the Eat Shoots and Leaves company. Me and my buddy Jordan put together here. Um, we did microgreens. We did uh, pea, sunflower, radish, uh, buckwheat. Same day cut, delivered in, in the area. We provide healthy eating aficionados, starve for good food, high quality same day cut microgreens that are so nutritionally dense, people can feel the difference. Now think about that for a second. You're that client. Do you know exactly if you're my client or if you're not my client? It's real specific. I do this with all my businesses. Life design, I help permaculture practitioners and promoters who are stalled, stuck, and stagnated create a ruthless clarity of vision to live in right livelihood. I'm using the words that the people I work with use. If I was doing this to the open public, I'd have to change this. Uh, with, my home, with, my, um, with my land design folks, new homesteaders or farms who are confused about developing their land, create and implement an adaptive plan to live an abundant land-based life. People get what I do the first conversation I have with them. Working with uh, a wood company, a firewood company, we put this together. We provide remote households who are frustrated with finding reliable firewood, dried, split, full cord, large firewood, delivered when promised for peace of mind and a warm home. Anybody else feel like they were just hugged by tree beards? Like <laughs> they reached out and was like, we know your problems. We want to help you. Here's what we do. We hope you like it. Hug. Like. We can be amazing forces of good with our businesses. It's, it's our opportunity to make utopia. Our businesses are the way to make utopia. If you want an amazing short book on business, Anything You Want by Derek Sivers. Put together CD Baby, the first independent um, CD music uh, uh, store, online store. Great book, simple read. The audiobook's like two hours long. And he has that great line. It's, it's your utopia. It's your vision of the world. My vision of the world is that Every person who's ever been programmed and controlled to be overconsumptive is programmed to think that they're isolated, that they can't take care of their limiting beliefs. I want to change that. That's what my life design work is about. It's about changing a fundamental problem in my lifetime. Here's another piece of advice that I give to clients that I'll give to you guys today. Work on a problem that is so big that you can't complete it in your lifetime. Because every day you'll wake up and you'll work on that problem and work on that problem. You'll gnaw on that bone every single day. And the next day you got to work on it again. And the tenacity of that outweighs anything else because you'll be in the game as long as you want to be. You won't have to find different solutions. You won't have to find different interests because you'll be working on the problem. Again, we come back to that problem idea. So niching statements, highly recommended. We work with these kinds of people with these kinds of problems who feel this way about the problems, helping them to get those results. Again, if you go through the survey, I'll send you this PDF. You'll have all of this as notes. So last but not least, getting to the end here, Business Canvas. This is the most business design tool I've come across. Uh, friends of mine, um, uh, they, they charge corporations $15,000 to run through this 8.5 by 11 page piece of paper. And I'm going to show it to you here. This is it. This is an entire business that can be brainstormed in half a day with two or three people. It's incredible. It's called the Business Model Canvas. Look it up online. They make it freely available online. And I can tell you after looking at all of these different types of ways of building a business, this is by and far one of the most important things I've ever come across. If I could do it all again, I would have learned holistic context first. I would have gone through zones of brilliance. It took me you know, seven years to get it all where I wanted it. And I would go through this process to figure out, okay, what's the business and what are all the pieces? So I understood how to run this business. This is a simple process. This is how I help people create a business in two weeks. It's not a difficult process once you build it down to little steps and we're just coloring in boxes. So usually I give this 10, 10, 100 challenge, but I'm sure you folks have already, uh, you'll already be given a challenge. So I'll say this, in the next 10 days, 10 hours, 100 bucks in your currency, uh, Take what I've, I've talked about during this, uh, this 
this uh, presentation and do something with it. This is all neat information, but actually physically do something. Uh, build a niche statement. Take a look at your zones of brilliance. Uh, start to work with holistic context. Take a look at my website. See if the work I do makes good sense for you. Uh, this isn't a pitch to work with me. This is a pitch that you actively design your life because the more you do that, there's one less person who's being controlled out there. And if you're independent, you're going to make good thoughts and good conversations. When I've done this 10, 10, 100, people have gone on to do amazing garden work after a PDC, started a hempcrete house, a chicken coop, uh, started a seed company, which was pretty cool. Um, my whole philosophy is just to wake up every day, kick <laughs> ass, and repeat ad nauseum, however that is for you. So this is on my board. It's what I wake up to every day. And uh, if you want to reach out and say hello to me, you can reach me at uh, javin at allpointsdesign.ca or you can go to the life design page. That's all points, um, all points life. It's actually allpointslife.com. It's not allpointslifedesign. It's allpointslife.com. And you can take a look. I also have a YouTube channel under my name and, um, and other aspects to chat about. Um, such a pleasure to talk with you guys. I love talking to folks who are active in business and, and moving towards. So I don't know how much time we have there, uh, Damien, because I'm sure we've um, we started. We've, at yeah, we've, we've gone over. i got to go to some other stuff. But I'm going to make your stuff available for people so they know how to contact you. Um, and and that, was, that was awesome. That was very dense uh, in, in the best sense of that. It was that nutrient-dense brain food. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Well, else. Round of applause. Cheers. Thank you I'll very send much, out, Gavin. I'll send Thank out the survey to Damien. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, awesome. Thank okay. Thanks. Thanks.